space prior to the elections. We analyze state vulnerabilities to hybrid threats and work with civil servants to cover these gaps. Or, within our latest initiative, the Alliance for Healthy Infosphere, we examine how to make social media more just and transparent for everyone. But then, we also focus on how all these attempts to undermine our democracies actually impact the societies. By conducting a series of opinion polls and focus groups, we are able to monitor trends in public attitudes towards key issues that shape the societies, including the support for EU and NATO membership, the perception of media, or satisfaction with democracy. Based on all this research, which was quoted, for example, by the US Senate, the French government, but also in major international media, such as Foreign Policy or the New York Times, we provide recommendations to a range of stakeholders on both sides of the Atlantic. But we also try to make a difference on the ground. By partnering with other think tanks, universities, public institutions or media, we created two online courses on disinformation. We develop manuals on strategic communication. We provide trainings for public officials or NGOs. We even engage YouTubers in a campaign focusing on young people. With all these activities, we generate new ideas, provide creative solutions, and engage relevant stakeholders to drive positive change towards more resilient democracies in this dynamic and digital age. To find out more, follow our debates, our social media, and visit our website, globsec.org. Hello, my name is Dominika Haidu, and I'm a research fellow at uh, Globsex Democracy and Resilience Program. I have a great privilege today to moderate a session uh, dedicated to a trend called uh, Rising Divisions Will Change the Face of Democracy, during which uh, we will discuss the future of democracy uh, amid the post-COVID crisis. Um, so with that being said, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our panel, uh, Christopher Walker, Vice President for Studies and Analysis at the National Endowment for Democracy. Then uh, Laura Silver, Senior Researcher at the Pew Research Center. And uh, Joanna Rohozinska, uh, Resident Program Director Europe at the International Republican Institute. Um, this session will be slightly different as we will begin with some con contextual data first, uh, showing what the people, the very basic component of every system to function, actually think about democracy and the way the governance system functions today. So let me begin with uh, presenting uh, you with our research, uh, which is called uh, Voices of Central and Eastern Europe. You can find it on our website. Um, in this report, we analyzed attitudes of more than 10,000 uh, uh, people from Central and Eastern Europe. And within the report, we found out, uh, among others, that people are generally not satisfied with how their governance system functions. Um, they feel disconnected from their uh, governing elites, as uh, around 60% of them think that their needs are not taken into account by the system in their country. 70% believe that those with the contact to political elites are favored in the society. And uh, while on average 87% of, of uh, respondents said that they were satisfied with life, 42% percent are uh, satisfied with how democracy works in their country only. Um, the satisfaction is strong only in Austria, uh, but it is below 50 percent in all the countries in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, before I pass the words to Laura, I would like to encourage uh, uh, all the attendees uh, watching us to ask questions uh, via platform as there will be a Q&A session um, during the last 10 minutes of, of the debate. And now I would like to pass uh, the words to Laura, uh, who will provide us with more global insight, and I would like to ask uh, for the presentation as well. <laughs> 
Great, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here and to share the data from Pew Research Center. Um, as Dominica mentioned, we are hoping to provide a more global kind of picture of this. Unfortunately, with only seven minutes, I can't get into the intricacies of each particular country, but I look forward to a question and answer session where maybe I can share a bit more. Next slide. Before I start, I just want to give you a sense of what these data are. This survey was conducted across 34 countries from May to October of 2019, so before the COVID-19 pandemic. And every survey is nationally representative. Next slide. Here you can see the countries represented in the survey. So we cover Europe relatively heavily in this survey with both Western Europe and Central and Eastern European countries represented, but we also have key countries in many other regions of the world. Next slide. What I'm gonna to speak to you about first is people's attachment to different democratic rights and institutions. Next slide. First, you can see here that we asked about a number of different principles, all of which might be considered to be important to a democracy. We asked people whether or not they were very important, somewhat important, not too important, or not important at all. And you can see here, medians based on the 34 countries that we surveyed. So while there was variation across the countries, and I'll show you that in one moment, generally speaking, we saw that a few principles were considered very important. First was a fair judiciary. In almost every country that we surveyed, a fair judiciary was either the first or the second most important democratic tenant. Second to that often was gender equality. People tended to say that gender equality was very important to have in their country. Where there was a little bit more variation though was on issues of free religion. In the countries where people tended to identify as very religious, they were more likely to see this as an important tenet. In other parts of the world, including in Western Europe, free religion was seen as much less important. And then when it comes to other tenets like free speech, press freedom, freedom of the internet, we saw generally that people were relatively varied across countries as to whether or not this was important at all. Generally speaking, people in Western Europe were more likely to say each of these was very important than people in most other regions, including Central and Eastern Europe. And when it came to issues like human rights groups operating freely or opposition parties operating freely, we sometimes saw a few people in some of these countries saying that they were important at all. Next slide. Here you can see the variation that I talked about. So just to give you some, um, like an illustrative map to get at this idea, here you can see the percentage of people by country who say it's very important to have a free media in our country without government or state censorship. You can see, for example, that only 28% of Lebanese say that this is very important, but 89% of Greeks say that it's very important. So it really runs the gamut. When we look at which countries consider it to be very important, it doesn't necessarily correlate with places that have press freedoms either. In fact, some of the countries where we might see relatively high rankings um, among some of the external indices for press freedoms are ones that don't necessarily value it as much. You might look, for example, to the Netherlands or Germany, where only around two thirds tend to say it's very important. Next slide. But one thing that's perhaps encouraging for people who are interested in democratic freedoms is that for a handful of freedoms, particularly media freedom and internet freedom, more people today say that it's very important in their country to have these things than said the same when we asked the question in 2015. You can see, for example, um, in places like the UK and Turkey, differences are of 19 percentage points between 2015 and 2019. Next slide. So we've seen generally that people have some commitment to democratic institutions and democratic freedoms, but not necessarily to all of them equally, and it varies across the world. But how then do they think democracy is working in their country? Next slide. Here again, you can see the median percentages. On balance, people are dissatisfied with democracy rather than satisfied. More people tend to say that they are not satisfied with how democracy is performing in their country than to say that they are satisfied. And some of this is related to the next column that you see, which is in general, people tend to think that elected officials don't care what people like them think. It's also related to that people necessarily believe that the state is run for the benefit of all people. As I'll show you in one moment too, this is a sense that's changed over time and not for the better. So despite all of this dissatisfaction, people were much to voting. Around two thirds, the median of two thirds, say that voting gives people like them a say in how the government runs things. And people are relatively committed to the idea of voting and to elections, even if they tend to be dissatisfied with the outcome at times. Next slide. 
And here's what I mentioned about the state being run for the benefit of all people. You can see that over the last two or so decades, we've seen a stark decrease in the percentage of people who agree that the state is run for the benefit of all people. And the decrease is sharpest in many countries in Western Europe, as well as in the US and some, some parts of um, Eastern Europe as well. Next slide. So one of the things that we've wanted to understand is why people are dissatisfied with democracy. One of the main factors that seems to affect people's satisfaction is whether or not they think the current economic situation in their country is good or is bad. In Hungary, the gap is largest. You're looking at a dot plot essentially that's just showing the most severe differences, but this was actually a pattern that we found in almost every country that we surveyed. Generally, people who say that the current economic situation is bad in their country are much less likely to say that they're dissatisfied with democracy than people who say that the current economic situation is good. Next slide. Moreover, people who think that their children will not have good opportunities tend to be more, more dissatisfied with democracy. Here again, you can see that Slovakia and Hungary stand out for the magnitude of the difference here. People who are pessimistic about their children's opportunities are more likely to be dissatisfied than those who are optimistic. Next slide. And as I mentioned, believing that elected officials don't care what people like you think tends to be uh, very closely related to people's satisfaction with democracy. This disenchantment with elites and this general sense that elites are out of touch is something that we've recorded in many of our surveys. Next slide. So what then do people want and are there opportunities for other systems of government that people might be open to? Next slide. Here you see data from a 2017 survey that we conducted. The countries are slightly different and the median here is based on 38 countries, but the general patterns that we see um, are relatively steady. First, when we ask people whether or not representative democracy would be a good or a bad way to govern the country, generally speaking, we see that this is the most appealing form of government for everyone that we surveyed. 78% um, tend to say that this is a good option. There's some support also for direct democracy. There's a little bit more it comes with rule by expert, rule by a strong leader, or rule by the military. But notably, around a quarter of people in some of these countries, and a median of a uh, quarter across the 38 countries, say that rule by a strong leader or rule by the military would be a good way to govern their countries. So we wanted to understand who's more committed to representative democracy and who's more committed to rule by strong leader or military. Next slide. When it comes to commitment to a representative democracy, one of the things that predicts people's support for this is a general sense that diversity makes their country a better place to live. So you can see in some of these countries, for example, in South Africa and in Sweden, this tolerance for multiculturalism, for diversity, tends to make people much more likely to think that a representative system where, people, where representatives are elected by citizens who decide what becomes law is a better way to govern the country. Next slide. The same is also true about children's optimism. Once again, the general sense that things are going in the correct direction for the next generation, that opportunities will exist, is strongly related to support for a representative dem democratic system. Those who are more pessimistic about this tend to be less likely to support representative democracy and much more open to non-democratic alternatives. Next slide. And this, this sense of nostalgia and this sense of opportunity are also related to children's opportunity. So we ask people not just about children's opportunities, but whether or not they say that life for people like them um, is better or worse compared to 50 years ago. And those who generally see that people like them have improved tend to be more likely to support representative democracy, whereas those who are kind of more nostalgic for the past or who think that they had more opportunities 50 years pr um, prior are less likely to be open to representative democracy. So these are not all of the factors that are related to people's support for representative democracy, but hopefully they give some sense for what's leading people to be satisfied or dissatisfied across the globe. One of the things that we tend to see is that people are attached to democratic principles, but don't necessarily believe that the principles are being delivered upon and that their satisfaction has been, I'm sorry, their dissatisfaction has been growing in recent years. Next slide. So I look forward to talking with you more in the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, very interesting insight uh, to start with. I believe that there is a bit of a paradox that, that we could see there, that at one hand, as you rightly said, on one hand, we have 
people valuing um, um, basic democratic principles. They want to have a, a judiciary which is independent. They are committed to voting, but at the same time, they feel disillusioned, they feel disconnected. Um, and as some of the largest uh, democracy indexes say, like Freedom House or, or Vedem Liberal Democracy Index, the democratic standards as such in Western Europe, as well as Central and Eastern Europe are declining. So my question to Joanna, if I may, would be, um, are, did people uh, stop uh, caring about democracy? Are the standards declining because people stop caring or do they have a reason to do so? And if they do, what is, what is wrong now with, with the way democracies function? So I'm glad you started with a really easy question that doesn't require that you know that has a really simple answer. So so thank you. First of all, actually, thank you for for having me on this panel and for for the conference in general. Um, I think that that one of the interesting things that what Lisa was showing is that while people do respect democracy as a whole, they don't necessarily recognize all of the component parts of it. So the fact that they're not valuing free media and the need for independent organizations and NGOs and human rights organizations kind of shows that there's a disconnect, which means that the, the way that democracy seems to be being defined is limited to the state sector and we're really limiting the conversation to how the government and elected officials are functioning. Um, and I, there does seem to be a broad perception somehow this is not right, that it is being run by elites and whether you want to talk about a global elite or you want to talk about a country elite, but that essentially somehow there's, politics has become a game as opposed to a genuine engagement with the population and therefore speaking for it. Um, you know, and again, I think a lot of this ends up being perception rather than fact. I mean, fundamentally, the way that parliaments function have always functioned, but perhaps there's a degree of complacency in terms of the degree to how authentic, or there's a sense that there's an inauthenticity on the part of elected officials and how they engage in the public, and that they take for granted that the things have functioned over the past 50 years is how they're going to continue. Um, and if there's one thing that history shows is that for one, it's not linear which means that there always has to be some kind of evolution. It's also not completely cyclical, right? I had a very intelligent history professor who always said that it was more like an ellipsis, which means that it goes out and it comes back in different forms, but it means you have to always go through a process of tweaking and changing. Um, I'll end with one thing that, that perhaps it was covered in a different panel, but it just came up in, in a conversation yesterday, is that perhaps one of the, one of the, positive aspects of the global COVID pandemic has demonstrated that the disconnect with the general population and the lack of engagement with non-state actors, including media, including NGOs, demonstrates that there's a very real risk to the public not trusting its government, right? It means that it is less compliant to regulations that the government proposes, which in fact saves lives. And so because this introduced a very real physical and health threat, perhaps it's going to be a learning opportunity for the more aspect of democracy in the sense that this is where the democratic or the governance gaps have a consequence on all parts of society from the state actors to the non-state to the general citizen. But it remains to be seen how well that lesson is learned. Thank you very much. Um, absolutely. Um, it, uh, I completely agree with the fact that uh, we are facing um, sort of a, uh, a new opportunity to, to perhaps also uh, maybe uh, redefine the rules of the game. But at the same time, we are facing a huge uh, crisis uh, uh, in the in amid uh, the the, the COVID nineteen nineteen pandemic, and uh, we cannot at the at the moment probably um, uh, uh, predict any any economic, social, political consequences. So I would like to ask Chris, um, since we are facing this multi dimensional crisis right now, um, 
isn't this, uh, to the on the contrary, a perfect and fertile ground for, for populists and for, for anti-democratic liberal forces to actually deepen and to exploit these vulnerabilities and actually deepen the divisions in the society and, and polarization and, and intensify these campaigns? So thank you for the question, Dominica. And um, I just want to acknowledge right at the outset the, the value and importance of the work that you do at Globesec and the work that Pew Research does. I think one of the things we see from, from these data is that the challenges, as you suggest, to democracy that have emerged are um, emerging on multiple fronts. And there's no single factor, I think, that can be um, set out as, as a principal factor for this sort of challenge. Um, and I think in that context, you know, the, the, um, among the largest uh, challenges we've faced has been this enormous shift in the way in which people um, absorb information, receive information. Joanna alluded to this in terms of how people perceive the situation around them and the governance around them. And I think it's important just for a moment to, to touch on um, how we've arrived at this place, looking at, say, the last um, 15 years or so and the extraordinary pace of change that, that's occurred. And so on the one hand, we've had the weakening of traditional media, and I would note that in both the Globesec findings and in the Pew Research findings, there's, there's a good deal of discussion about the emergence of conspiracy theories on the one hand, the erosion of trust in the media space, and I think these are really critical factors among the many factors that have emerged that are driving uh, some of the problems we're facing. And so certainly since the financial crisis of 2008, there's been an acceleration of the weakening, weakening of traditional media. There's been really explosive growth of digital media, especially social media, happening together. And I think in this context, we've probably underappreciated the degree to which today people would be consuming news and information in new ways, the way in which political campaigns would be organized and driven, and really critically the way mass opinion is formed today. It's dramatically different than even a decade ago. And I think all of this has to be taken into account when we think about the research data we're evaluating, the public opinion data we're looking at, and how that's been influencing um, people around the world. And so in a sense, the the real issues that have emerged, say, in the Central and European context, where people in certain countries have um, taken a much more critical look at their own political elites. Uh, there's an element of frustration in the way in which um, democracy is seen to be delivering. At the same time, there are any number of settings in, in the wider region where, in the democratic context, uh, democracies have a good deal of resilience. And I would say the Baltic states Scandinavian states fall into these categories, broadly speaking. Um, and then, of course, if we shift from a discussion of open societies, which have um, extensive challenges that, that have been discussed, I think, very well earlier in the session, if we look at closed societies, I think in this context, um, we see the struggle for freedom uh, continuing there. And so in a country like Belarus, right now we're seeing ordinary Belarusians express their preferences for democratic freedoms in the face of enormous repression and in the face of years and years of extraordinary uh, repression and control of ordinary citizens' aspirations there. And in that context, we're seeing the use of digital technologies in a, in a really important and positive sense for people to be able to express themselves. And I think part of the challenge we're going to face going forward, again, not as a sole challenge among the many that have hit any number of societies over the past years, I think one of the things we're really going to have to reckon with is how to uh, sustain the positive aspects of the digital uh, technological revolution while dealing with, in a meaningful way, the more toxic and harmful aspects of this that are both driving um, and accelerating and amplifying anger, some of which is already there, uh, and otherwise uh, debilitating uh, open society's capacity for meaningful and reasonable discussion in order to come to um, solutions to these very complicated problems. And I think it's fair to say that uh, many societies are arriving at an inflection point when it comes to sorting out uh, 
these real challenges that have emerged in the social and economic context, uh, but also as it relates to how information is consumed and used uh, in these settings in a way that uh, would be more consistent with liberal democratic values. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so um, this was a very valuable contribution in a way that as far as I understood, you've said that um, we are indeed lying in front of the crossroads, um, not only in the offline world, but also in the online world. Um, 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 so let me follow up on that and ask Laura um, whether you think that while uh, the crisis um, might uncover uh, these, these vulnerabilities and these weak points in the societies, um, whether uh, this is also an opportunity uh, for, the, for, for, for the people to actually, or to work with the people, whether, whether people are initially uh, more tempted to, 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 to change uh, their opinions under, under the pressure of the crisis. That's such an interesting question. And I think Joanna brought up something interesting when she talked about how this um, governance gap at this point in time is, um, it really points to the effects of distrust in government. Unfortunately, one of the things that we found in a survey that we released only yesterday is that at least in some countries, there's a partisan view of how um, different leaders have responded to the COVID-19 crisis. We only were able to survey this year um, in phone countries because of the global pandemic we couldn't send interviewers face to face i'm sure everyone understands but so in the countries that we did survey which are predominantly in europe one of the things that we found is that in the us and the uk people's evaluations of how well covid 19 has been dealt with in their countries is completely filtered through a partisan lens and so while i think there could be potentially some opportunities and some recognition that trust in science is important and trust in institutions is important that's not necessarily enough to break through people's distrust of certain elites and certain institutions. Um, as we're speaking about, for example, trust in elites, it's important to note that depending on who you talk to, the elites are not just the people in parliament or the people in Congress. The elites sometimes extend, and we've learned this through focus groups that we've conducted in numerous countries, they extend to the people running the banks or the people who are in charge of the economic policy to get us out of the COVID-19 crisis, or especially to the media. Um, and in a time of increased media choice and media fracture, as well as just the proliferation of entertainment options so people don't have to consume the same information as their neighbors, it's a really difficult scenario to see how, um, how we can break out of, even with this major disruptive event, COVID-19, that in some places has definitely led to decreased polarization. That just hasn't been uniform across all of the countries that we study. Thank you. I would like to follow up on the um, on the fact that uh, you mentioned that uh, what is the definition of, of the elites or the perception of the elites. Um, and one of the elites you mentioned uh, are the economic elites, so bankers. Um, and also our data show that people feel like there is a strong oligarchic influence o over the government. So do you believe one of those um, one of those redefining versions of the game should be a more, more strong uh, or stronger um, economic intervention, stronger economic reforms. Uh, in Europe and Scandinavia, there are already ongoing uh, some um, 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 experiments such as uh, universal basic income or, or, or taxation, stronger taxation of, of, of large companies. Uh, Joanna? So I think that's a really difficult question to pose for a global answer, right? Just because the approaches are so significantly different. I mean, the, the on I will I refrain from commenting on U.S. politics, say writ large, but it is it is hard to imagine support for universal basic income since there's already such a discussion about universal health care, which is a given in a lot of the other countries that that Laura mentioned in the survey. I mean, in Europe, it's it's universal medicine is, is obvious, right? So, so I, 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 I would be loath to give such a low, huge, huge answer. If we, if we bring it to, I think that what you can say, um, and I would suspect that part of the distrust in the elites, particularly in the banking sector in terms of you know, oligarchs and, and whatnot, is a lack of transparency. Frankly, which so which should lead a little bit to a to a governance well, right? The lack of transparency on that part of it, and 
increasing that could perhaps be um, a, a more gentle way to go if without talking about direct economic interventions, which again, I'm not, I'm not uh, for one, well placed, but for two, skeptical about the implementability of that across all of the spectrum of countries that we're just talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but the but the one thing that certainly, in terms of the governance gaps and and in terms of the um, distrust towards generally, and this is also the absolute breeding ground for for any kind of disinformation and malign influence, is the lack of transparency. People feel that their interests aren't being represented because. They don't know, right? Because they figure that there's some shadowy, how do you say, global conspiracy theories of cosmopolitan elites is nothing new. This has been going on forever. So, I mean, I think that we're seeing kind of like a 2020 version of this. Um, you know, if you want to start putting other, um, other phobias on top of it, that's fine. But I mean, ultimately what it ends up coming down to is that if you don't understand and if it's not transparently clear how certain mechanisms take place and how the certain decisions are made. I mean, having 100% transparency is also obviously inefficient, but certainly more than exists now. I mean, I think that, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the European countries have been quite painful walking through the problem, mixed about how, how effective it has been. But, you know, for example, you know, the call for greater accountability on the part of European bureaucrats, as we saw played out quite, quite dramatically, the other day when there was, depending on the version that you're looking for, either the firing of or the walking away of a senior minister due to breaking, you know, breaking, breaking the rules on, on COVID. Um, so that's, that's my kind of long answer to it. But I mean, again, direct economic interventions, I don't think are necessarily realistic across this entirely huge playing field, but certainly uh, a greater degree of transparency and at least the feeling of greater accountability, I think, would go a long way to closing the governance gaps quite broadly. Thank you. So greater transparency and accountability and transparency, as I understood, across, you know, uh, across the, the different sectors. So on the Internet, um, also within the governments and the governance systems and, and, and in the finance sector. Um, Chris, when it comes to solutions, um, as, as Joanna already started, uh, where would you see um, um, where, what we should do in, uh, in order to, to address this, uh, this disconnect? How can we strengthen the resilience of democracies? So I think the, you know, it's important, um, as the other speakers have noted, to distinguish, I think, between um, some of the countries we're discussing, which are closed authoritarian systems and whose people are um, struggling for greater democratic freedoms, and then the uh, considerable number of countries in the recent past which have experienced uh, democratic decline to one form or another for a variety of reasons. I think many of these have been touched upon. Some of them have to do with um, uh, deep feelings of uncertainty and insecurity that have been driven by globalization in an economic sense, in a social sense, and also in a technological sense. And I think these things, to one degree or another, are uh, reinforcing each other. For example, in the um, digital um, technological sense, in the social media sense, there, there's research and evidence to suggest that um, much of the discussion that's done in political terms can inspire uh, anger through use of emotion and manipulation. I think part of what we need to do on that count in order to find solutions over the longer term is to find um, efforts that can systematically adapt the digital space, improve the digital space so that it's less prone to manipulation and information pollution. And that's, that's no easy thing. I think the, the initiatives that have gotten underway uh, on a number of fronts in recent years are incredibly important. Some of these are being driven by the governments within democracies. Some of these are being undertaken to one degree or another um, in the commercial sector, not quickly enough in most cases, but civil society really plays a critical role on so many fronts here to help um, the general public understand the issues, to share information, to help educate on what are invariably very complicated issues. I think this is a big part of the way that we uh, develop the sort of resilience over time, having the expertise, having the understanding uh, 
so that our societies can have uh, a less polarized, more meaningful discussion to reach some form of consensus, which has become really difficult in so many settings. I would suspect all things being equal uh, in the recent decade or so, uh, this has just become uh, almost uh, impossible in many places. And I don't think that was the expectation looking from, say, 2005 or so. I think there was a, a different view of how things would emerge. And now we're in the midst of it. We're, we're wrestling to develop uh, approaches that can deal with these issues. I think it's going to be a multi-dimensional response to meet a multi-dimensional challenge. Some of this will have to do with uh, more transparency in the media sector, in the tech sector, in the financial sector, in democracies that are uh, behind on that count. I think I would note that um, you know, in Central Europe, and it's not unique to Central or Southeastern Europe, the merger or the overlap between commercial, political, and media interests has grown more acute. And this is something that this is, is not very healthy for democratic accountability. And it's not unique to, to that region. And I think this is something we have to reflect very seriously on uh, in terms of reforms and getting to a situation in which um, this sort of overlap and um, intersection is less visible in many parts of the world. So for a very difficult set of multidimensional challenges, I think we're going to uh, need to settle on some multidimensional responses to address these over time. Thank you. Definitely, a whole of society approach uh, will be needed here to, to address all, all the all the multi-dimensional problems. Um, Laura, um, what would you uh, suggest uh, um, needs to be fixing uh, needs to be fixed, uh, knowing that uh, or having studied um, the, um, the the attitudes and perceptions of of, of people all, all across the world. I think one of the things that we see is most correlated with democratic dissatisfaction, or the two things really, are a comfort with diversity and multiculturalism, um, and generally thinking that there are economic opportunities. And neither of those are easy fixes, and neither of those can be fixed in the same way across every country, certainly. Um, I'm obviously relatively familiar with the US case, um, but when we think about these issues and when candidates campaign on these issues, we generally see that people end up divided um, and polarization has increased in the US uh, quite rapidly over the last two decades or so. And so I don't have a solution and that's not necessarily something that Pew Research Center participates in, but those are definitely two of the correlates that we see with dissatisfaction that are some of the most difficult to resolve, obviously, but also the most fundamental. Um, if people have a sense that they have opportunities and that their children have opportunities, and if they're comfortable with the other people being represented, right, because multiculturalism and representative democracy necessitate that you feel like everyone should have their voices represented and everyone should be equal. So a tolerance for people who are different than you is definitely something that's incredibly important. Um, I don't have solutions for these, but I would say that these core, core issues are definitely fundamental particularly in the United States, just because of my own background, knowing about that one, but generally in all of the countries that we study, they tend to be the greatest predictors of comfort with representative democracy and satisfaction. Thank you. And could media play a, play a role in this? And how to um, make sure that, that, that uh, we keep the, the independent and, and, and uh, how, how we, Sorry, once again, could the media play a role in this? And how should we make sure that, that uh, we uh, keep the independent media um, and that also in the countries uh, where the media is um, either being suppressed or, or, or very much polarized? Um, Chris, would you like to answer the question? Well, I, I and my um, observations have gravitated and, and uh, focused a bit on the media and tech aspect of this because I think it's, it's fundamental among the many questions and to the extent, as Laura noted, that um, open societies that have the ability to discuss these issues can't reach some meaningful consensus and to the extent the polarization is too acute to uh, settle on public policy solutions that address these very serious needs that have emerged in recent years, uh, we really have our work cut out for us. I think the good news is, and Joanna touched on this earlier, uh, 
that in some ways these extraordinary challenges that um, are confronting us now, even preceding the COVID-19 pandemic, we've we've had ex we've had very significant challenges to democracy for uh, many many years now, going back I would say uh, at least by Freedom House's lights at least a decade and a half. Um, these require some dedicated serious solutions. I think there's a growing number of people who recognize the acute nature of these challenges, the need to address them in a meaningful way. And among those uh, responses to have information that's credible, uh, independent, and can be um, relied upon for addressing these serious challenges, some of which are uh, directly related to public health concerns, people's families, their well-being. I think this is helping to stimulate more of a recognition of just how important this is. Uh, getting to meaningful solutions and improvement will be a real challenge, and we have our work cut out for us because the extent of time that these challenges have been developing, and I alluded to this, the financial, in my view, the financial crisis of 2008 deepened and accelerated some already profound challenges to independent media in open societies. It made them more acute in closed societies as well, and in those places, um, the authoritarians who have resources at their, their disposal invariably make that a priority. We've seen this in Russia and China and elsewhere. Um, that may change as well uh, over time. My guess is it, it will. But for democratic societies and other open societies, it's really a challenge we need to reckon with on how we can um, reboot, in a sense, our information systems, our independent media, in ways that meet the needs of democratic societies and allow us to have meaningful debates that are civil and allow us to arrive at um, solutions that uh, meet people's needs. Thank you very much. Uh, we have three minutes uh, until the end of the discussion. So I would just uh, like to pose uh, the last question to, to all of you, um, whether you think uh, the glass is um, half full of or half empty. Are you more positive or uh, about the future? <laughs> Joanna, could, could we start with you, please? So I usually, I usually um, define myself as a realist. Frankly, I would not be in the job that I have held for over 20 years if I wasn't optimistic in some way. Um, I think that you just have to take a very long view of the issues that we have um, and that eventually things do turn out the way that they should, even with, even with dips along, along the road. So, so ultimately, I'm somehow optimistic though, though often people don't think I am. Um, that being said, you, know, you do have to be very realistic in the assessment of how deep the problems are. Polarization is a terrible problem and frankly, in a lot of these places, the fish does rot from the head. And so therefore the tone that is set by, um, by political leadership in any country um, and how that ends up going, flowing into the media sector and to us, you know, there is an onus on the elves to acknowledge and address these issues. Um, so I will end on, end, on, end on that. And I mean, hopefully again, that this, this global pandemic was perhaps a wake up call at least for some of them. So there is an opportunity for populists, obviously, but populists ultimately don't propose long-term solutions, right? Um, and they also don't necessarily create the problems, which means that the onus is on those public servants, elected or appointed or whatever, but public servants that are ultimately have a state's interest in mind and the citizen in mind have to step up um, and begin with fixing themselves ultimately before you look to fix the rest of it. Thank you. Laura, may I ask you to limit your intervention to one minute? I would say that I'm very interested to see different policy options that can be undertaken. I think Chris alluded to some of the potential regulation of social media. I think that could be a really interesting thing to change what people are exposed to and what tools they have to organize in an anti-democratic way. I've also been very interested to see um, citizen assemblies and other forms of kind of democratic interventions that people may or may not be taking opportunities to participate in. Um, I'm very curious to see how those will affect change. As a, as a person, I feel very optimistic. It, looking at the data, I think it'll take very skilled leadership because I um, basically agree with Joanna that 
the the onus often is on political leaders because publics tend to follow elite rhetoric on key issues, especially that they don't have personal experience with. Thank you. Chris. And I'm optimistic as well. I think we are at a period now where um, many societies that I think took certain things for granted are starting to reflect on the fact that uh, you need to pay attention in a democracy. You need to fight to maintain uh, freedoms that have been won. And I'm talking of democracies all over the world. We've had a discussion globally now. Um, and I think this is, this is a point at which looking from a post-Cold War period, we need to reflect and we're starting to reflect in open societies on what sort of commitment is required to sustain and renew and refresh democratic systems. So I'm very optimistic on that count and I'm equally optimistic on what we're seeing in any number of other settings where societies have lived under repression and authoritarianism, where they're starting to uh, express their preferences in ways that are quite clear. And I alluded to uh, Belarus earlier, uh, there are hundreds of thousands of people coming out on the streets to express their preferences, in my view, for democratic freedoms in the face of extraordinary repression and brutality. And I think that just should remind us who are already living in democratic societies of these aspirations being global. And we should support them uh, wholeheartedly and unreservedly. And this is another reminder um, of the need to keep um, struggling uh, both with people within our own societies to refresh these uh, sorts of aspirations, but uh, with others abroad that are doing so for their own freedoms. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Chris, Laura, and Joanna for, these, uh, for ending up with these optimistic remarks uh, in this topic, which is very challenging and were very difficult. Um, I would like to also thank uh, Globsec for this opportunity and uh, please stay tuned for the next session, which is called A More Fragmented EU. Globsec Tatra Summit drives discussions that shape the future of Europe. Uncertainty. You have uh, Brexit, 